Welcome to the Transformative Principal Podcast, where we learn how to be an amazing educational leader. I am your host, Jethro Jones. Are you ready to be a transformative principal? I'm looking for about 10 people who are ready to do what it takes to lead with integrity, find balance, and take your school to the next level. If you're looking to improve your leadership in a measurable way, go to transformativeprincipal.org slash mastermind to see if you qualify to join a group of like-minded people who are ready to be the best principals in the country. Welcome to Transformative Principal. Today I am interviewing Jason Markey, Anita Huffman, and Megan O'Neill, who work at Leiden High School in Chicago area. And they are going to share about some of the great things they're doing around innovation at this school. They're pretty awesome, and it was really great to meet them. And we barely scratched the surface, as always happens with these podcasts is people are doing so many amazing things. There's just so much more to talk about. I do want to talk a little bit before we get into that interview about the mastermind class or group that I'm uh, getting ready to offer. One of the big questions has been, why should we do a mastermind when we have all these free resources like Twitter and Voxer and all that kind of stuff? And the real reason is that when you join into a mastermind, you make a commitment to yourself and to that group of people for the time that you're going to be in there, that you're going to work hard to solve problems and make yourself and help the others make themselves the best that they can be. With social media, because it's free, because it's not something that you are jumping into with both feet, there is a possibility and a tendency that you're going to bail out at some point. And one of the things that can be hard when you're using those, which are great tools, which I use all the time, is that if you ask an important question and somebody else jumps in, sometimes your important question gets lost and you feel like you don't have the support that you need. A mastermind is definitely going to give you that support. And I'd love it if you'd give me a call and we can set something up so that we can see if it'll be right for you to be part of the mastermind. You know what? You can just call me right now. 801-7-JETHRO. That's 801 753 eight, four, seven, six. Give me a call. Let's talk. Do it right now. You know, you're listening to a podcast. How about we just talk to each other? That'd be great. If you're not ready to talk, go to the website and schedule a time so we can sit down and spend 20 to 30 minutes chatting and make sure it's something that's right for you. It's hiring season all across the country and time to dust off your interview questions. Go to transformativeprincipal.org to download 10 interview questions to find the best teachers. All right. Welcome to Transformative Principal. I'm at the NASSP conference this week, and I'm interviewing a couple of presenters, uh, Jason Markey and Anita Huffman. They gave a uh, session on innovation, and it was really cool to be there and see it. And they are doing some pretty innovative things. The first thing is, is that Jason's the principal of uh, East Layden High School, and Anita is the assistant principal of student services. Is that right? And that title you said Jason gave to you <laughs> as part of the job description. Jason, do you want to talk about why you came up with that name for her job title? Well, uh, it was full disclosure. It wasn't just me individually, but collaboratively as a district, when we designed the second assistant principal position, which we had not had ever before at our two high schools, we, we wanted the focus to be truly on supporting our students. So we, we did want that in the title. And, you know, so I think Anita gives us more credit for that. But she she does truly kind of live and model that every day and keeps students in the forefront of her mind and in her work and allows the students to really inform the supports that, that they need instead of us just assuming that, that we know. So, Anita, in most models, the assistant principal is the one who deals with all the discipline. So is that basically what student services means? No, it's actually the opposite. So we have two deans who kind of work with discipline. So really, I can have the time and the opportunity to really be focused on student support. So I'm able to, you know, make sure that all of our students are getting support, whether it's transitioning back from hospitalization to implementing a 504, to really looking at systematizing all of our programming to support our students. I'm fortunate in the the fact that I do um, have the opportunity and the time to, to do so. 
Cool. So you talked a little bit today about the breakfast that you do with incoming freshmen and how you acclimate them to the school. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the breakfast that we have for students is actually for all of our transfer students. So anyone who's transferred in and um, typically students are from a wide range, you know, freshmen early on, but we really see a lot of sophomores and juniors. And our population is, we have a strong Eastern European population. So we also have a lot of students who are transferring in that don't speak English. We have 30 languages spoken at East Leiden, so you know we need to be prepared to make sure that people feel comfortable in day one. And so the the transfer breakfast started and it has, has kind of morphed into a, a lunch, so that students can meet others that have their same lunch period, and and then um, I mix it with a little bit of information so that they get to feel comfortable about the upcoming events at the school, whether it's what's going on for homecoming to. Uh, what's final exams like here and how is it different from my past experience? And so we do it at lunch so that students can meet others who have the same lunch period so that they can kind of feel connected, especially during that, that time. Very cool. And one of the things that you also do is you give freshmen an extra 25 minutes each day. Can you talk about how that came about and what you do during that 25 minutes? So the access program has been around for Leiden for, I think this is year 11. Yeah, year 11. And it has really been designed to make sure that freshmen feel supported. And there, so it's a wide range of curriculum that's taught. And it's actually led by students. So upperclassmen volunteer their time to stay 25 minutes after school to help our freshmen. So I think that speaks a lot um, about the culture of the the school that our students are volunteering their time to help freshmen. And so I think the program is really vital in ensuring that that year is successful for our students. And so our access coordinator is is also uh, very open to making sure that we're targeting specific groups of students. And she has, you know, been integral in, in being a partner with me to ensure that we are really meeting all the needs of our kids. So do teachers stay with the kids also after school? And then what does that relationship look like with the teacher? Is the teacher just there being a supervisor or are they engaging in teaching content? And where do you draw the line on what the upperclassmen do and what the teacher does? Sure, that's a great question. So, you know, the the curriculum is really set and worked on through the access coordinator. And then the teacher is really facilitating, but they are uh, making sure the students are successful. So if they have a concern about a student, they're addressing it. They're really kind of building that connection so that the student has an adult in the building outside of, you know, during the academic day when the, the teacher is teaching that they can really connect with. And often we hand schedule students in, with the access teachers so that, you know, we when we work with our partner schools, we know that some students might need some additional support so that we make sure that they have an adult in the building that they feel connected to. So the teacher plays an integral role in the success of our, our freshmen as well. Very awesome. Can you talk a little about learning to breathe and and what that is doing at your school? Sure. So it's a pilot that's happening um, this year. It's just getting off the ground. And our other assistant principal for teaching and learning has been really key in, in bringing mindfulness to um the school conversation. She's led several lunch and learns for teachers and, and teach and how teachers can be mindful um, in their practice. She even leads early morning sessions for teachers to come and get in the right headspace. And then it's morphed into a mindfulness group for students. And now it's come to this kind of required study time. So it's really um, started with teachers and teachers really feeling like, yeah, this is something we buy into and we feel power. And then to a club to now it's we're helping our students who really need the the strategy to be present in the moment. And why is mindfulness so important? We hear a lot of talk about it for adults and for kids. What is it that it that makes it so important for you? Sure, I think it's really about empowering our social emotional learning and I feel like mindfulness is one of those tools. I think Given the past in education with NCLB, we've felt pressure to teach to the test and we have kind of pushed aside this kind of 
idea that we should be educating the whole child and we're just focused on the academic. And I, I feel like mindfulness really um, brings that back that we need to do some self care. And so students are learning how to, you know, care for themselves. And if the teacher is, is able to come into a situation and address it appropriately, then they're better equipped to help their students through the situation. So I think it's really bringing this kind of SEL conversation back to the forefront, especially in, in high school. So, Jason, what I'm hearing from Anita sounds a lot like some yes and thinking. Can you explain what that is and how that's more powerful than yes but thinking? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's a great example of it. It's, uh, pretty much all the work she has done has been building on ideas that, that someone else had, a work that was already going on, and then taking it to maybe the next step or the next iteration of it. Uh, so yes and thinking is something that we've borrowed uh, from a lot of different organizations and people, but really uh, it has its roots in improv comedy. And, w- and when two actors are doing a scene, two comedians, if they're improvisational, the actors have to go along with the other's idea, right? There, there's no way you can have a scene when I say, no, I'm not going to do that. So whatever scene that, that you give me, whatever idea you take, whatever you uh, position you put me in, I have to continue on that dialogue. And and really, so a, a lot of other organizations, and we've really taken this to heart, is a, a great way to build an initial conversation around an idea is using that yes and thinking. And, and even if it's just at that beginning portion, to, to allow an idea to kind of go back to the mindfulness uh an illusion there to allow the idea to breathe a little bit, right? And give it some space and give it a chance to grow before we kind of extinguish the flame that maybe is, is happening a little bit. So when you start, you know, to differentiate a little bit between how normal conversations go, you know, a bunch of administrators or teachers or students get around a, a table and they talk about an idea. It's pretty quick when the first yes, but comes out or no, that's not going to work or whatever the phrase happens to be. And it always has the same effect. Someone that was about to say something positive about that idea is silenced, right? And and they're not formally silenced. It's, it, no one says you can't say anything positive, but the direction is changed by someone that has a powerful voice around the table. And so if we, if we just take a, a moment to give an opportunity, the chance to breathe and build or uh, give an idea, the opportunity to, to build, then I think it can go to some, some really great places. Yeah. And I've seen that in my schools as well, that nobody really intends for the conversation to just die but it really does when you throw in the yes, but you shared a really good story about the inventor of FedEx and the power of or the negative example of yes, but and how he overcame that. Do you mind sharing that real quick? Yeah, sure. So the to paraphrase a bit, but the, the story goes and who knows if it's more legend than anything, but I would assume uh, the, the core part of it's true. When uh, one of the, the founders of FedEx was in college at Yale University, uh, his management professor gave him a C on a project. And that project happened to be essentially the blueprint for what FedEx is now. And what I really like is the the what, what helps the story is the reason why he gave him a C. So he basically said, this is a great idea. It's really well thought out, but for the project to earn more than a C in this class on management, it has to be feasible. So, I mean, talk about the classic yes, but, right? He's saying this is, this is such a great idea, but it's not feasible. I mean, that, that's, that's a pretty quick yes, but, and it, it's a powerful thing, I think, that, you know, we didn't really extend that conversation, but that then he still was driven to go beyond that, right? And that, and that's great. That's persistence and grit and all those things we talk about too, to overcome a yes, but, but, you know, it'd be nice to eliminate those at least early in the conversation. Yeah. When I left my last school, the school psychologist there, she gave me a card that said something like, don't ever tell Nacho, this little Chihuahua dog on the front, that he can't do it. And then the inside says, because he'll just prove to you that he can do it. And that that little card, I, I don't remember if that's the exact quote or not, but that message is really powerful for me and reminds me that, you know, if somebody says no, that doesn't mean that's the end. That just means you got to figure out a different way to do it. And it's a lot easier when someone, instead of saying no, says yes and to help you out. So you also started an innovation incubator. Can you talk a little bit about that? And we're going to get some thoughts from Megan as well. Yeah. So just uh, for clarity's sake, whenever you asked me a question, said you, uh, I'll just uh, I'll just say that it's something that we have done uh, definitely district wide, too. So we have two high schools in our district, um, East and West Leiden, and we work very closely together on all of these things. So uh, it was it was certainly a conversation around the table and our leadership team last year. And and the yes and thinking is really what got us to this this idea where 
we were talking a lot about, you know, all different things, which is what we do in, you know, in school leadership. We have all of these different things we want to affect and we want to see improvements in, but we all have a limited capacity just to deal with stuff, right? That our list can only be so long if we want it to be effective. And when we looked at what our teachers were spending their time on, the time we designed for them uh, was really to collaborate around primarily assessment and curriculum. Those two things for, mo for the most part, right? And th there's a huge piece of that, which is a lot of people refer to as instruction, but I like to think of it as kind of the student experience, right? What is the work that kids are actually doing? And we were just assuming that teachers were doing that on their own time. And I think we all know that their own time is what, like 3 a.m. in the morning when, we, you know, something else isn't scheduled. So what we wanted to do is, is figure out how to give them the time and space to be creative. So what we finally got to was some of that that style of thinking that we were talking about earlier is, you know, the only way to do that is to tell them they're, they're stopping something. And so we, we basically announced this idea of having an innovation incubator, which is uh, we said it'd be eight to 10 teachers district wide, maybe four or five from each campus. Uh, they would come together. We have collaborative time built in, which is nice uh, weekly. So three out of the four weeks a month that they were going to come together and meet as an interdisciplinary group, which meant they were going to stop meeting with their algebra one team or their literacy team or whatever team they were a part of. So they weren't going to focus on curriculum and assessments. They were going to focus on the student experience and student learning. And we didn't tell them really anything else other than the process they were going to use, which was design thinking. So that, that's probably a good place for maybe Megan to, to pick up from there. Cool. So you gave a presentation today and in it, you talked about a innovation incubator that you're doing at your school. Can you tell me a little bit more about what that group is? Sure. We were, it was presented to us at an in-service meeting last year to kind of apply to be in this new PLC group, but we weren't given any description on what it was and no constraints, no parameters. We did an, a design thinking workshop over the summer. And from there, we just kind of started this process of how can we find a problem in our school? And then what can we propose to solve that problem? That's very cool. So have you found a problem? Um, we have, well, we found a few problems that kind of work together, right? And we can't solve all of them, but some of them that we thought uh, were great to address are student engagement, group work, teaching to test. You know, those are some, some of the issues that our students kind of struggle with. And then with teachers, uh, more about collaboration and wanting to be creative and wanting to have more autonomy in the classroom and kind of wanting to feel invigorated and find that passion in their teaching practices again. So those are the things that we thought we would address in our group. And how easy was it for you to come to that conclusion? Was that like, these are just staring us in the face or did you have to go searching? What kinds of things did you do to figure that out? So to build empathy and to start the design thinking process, we interviewed students and teachers, uh, about 30 teachers and about 30 students, different uh, subject areas and grade levels and academic levels. And it just was a kind of, those were the things that were kind of glaring us in the face after interviewing so many, so many different kids and kind of finding out what the responses were and looking at all of those. Those are the things that we saw were the big issues that our kids are facing in school. Okay. And, and I imagine you've been doing this for a few months now. Did you come up with a some solutions to those issues? We came up with a lot of solutions to the issues, and that's part of the design thinking process is you come back to the table with a bunch of different ideas, which we all had different ideas on how to solve these problems. But we kind of all jumped on board with one that we all really liked, and we're in the prototype stage now. We've designed a interdisciplinary curriculum. Uh, it's a block schedule and it's PBL and standards-based grading, and we're going to kind of take that and run with it. We're Right now we're developing a course, and we're going to test it with uh, other teachers and students and hopefully propose something to our administration. Well, that's pretty cool. What was the process like in the room with those teachers coming up with these decisions? Were there disagreements? Did everything go smoothly? How did you work through that? Uh, there are always disagreements when you get a lot of, you know, really intelligent, really passionate, really creative people together, but it was an awesome process. You know, we're, this group works amazingly together and it's very cool to see, you know, special ed teachers and AP teachers from different content areas getting along so well and being able to have that disagreement, but then also being able to come up with the compromise and really just working with that end goal of what's best for students. That's awesome. So what are some of your suggestions for people who are 
working through something, what kind of norms or rules did you set with the group so that they would feel like they could and should be doing the best work possible? It has to be, you know, and this has kind of been a theme of discussion in all of the presentations and breakout sessions today, especially at, at the uh, Ed Camp too, is it has to be a safe place to fail. Um, so teachers have to feel like they can say, you know, it's just like our students. We have to feel like we can say something and it might sound stupid or we might be afraid of what we're saying. And there's that vulnerability piece, but that other people aren't going to personally attack us or criticize us for what we believe and what we think. Yeah. And you're right. That has been a topic and often is a topic because it's so important. What advice would you have for a principal out there who might want to start a PLC like this? How would they get it going? Was the way your principal told you with no information, was that good enough or what else would help make it start? I think that you have to start off kind of that way. You have to present it to your staff that this is a complete unknown because for us, it wasn't unknown until we started the design thinking process and you have to let these, these teachers self-select. So you have to let them say, I don't know what this is, but Hey, I'm down. It's cool. Let's try it. If you try to force it on them, it's, you're not going to have authentic results. Great. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And how do people get in touch with you and learn more from you? You can find me on Twitter at M-E-O'Neill1, um, or you can email me, moneal at Leiden212.org, and that's O'Neill, O-N-E-I-1-L. Thank you. I really love coming to these conferences and learning from these great people, and I hope that you appreciate the opportunity to learn as well. It's been so amazing for me, and I thank you for taking the time to listen to this and to share it and to leave a rating and review if you are able. I really appreciate your support. Have a great day and you can follow me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. Transformative Principal is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Visit edupodcastnetwork.com to hear more great podcasts that will help you improve your teaching and leading.